and when he'd done that, he then turned 12 beads, no calipers, no nothing, passed them round with a vernier, and not one of them was a, a foul difference in the size of those beads. No idea what he did that for, but that was the beginning. And then he started making a baby's rattle all out of ivory. It contained three parts, a finial, a body, and a handle. And each one of those was, tap, um, was hand threaded, male and female. The main body, he drilled some holes in it so that the rattle, and he, those beads he made, he put inside the body of the rattle. And to this day, I, I'm still amazed at what he did that day with no calipers in sight. And he did the thread chasing on those three pieces. And then he turned a chest set of 12 pieces, each again, hand threaded with no calipers in sight. It, it, it was an amazing man to watch. He really was. His, his books, if you can find a used one, they're, they're kind of pricey now because they're, they've been out of print for so long. But I tell you what, I've gone back and reread those things uh, a yeah. couple of times. They're so entertaining. And, and the thing that fascinates me about the guy is, as I won't say he dropped out of school, based on his profession, his edu formal education ended at age 16 as he went into the trades. But his ability to write and communicate and entertain with the, with the written word, I, I just marvel at. Yeah. Well, he started work, at, his father got him a job in the this uh, turning factory, which was turning out uh, shaving brush handles and what have you. And he went in and he was shown the first day what he had to do. The next day he had to turn some and get them approved and then he had to turn 50 a day after that so he had two days training and he was thrown in the deep end wow and he was the last wood uh, last turner i'm not going to say wood turner <coughs> the last turner i know who was still eligible to turn ivory because the ivory that they had was all pre-1948 after that, I'm here with the disc, so, okay. Albert yeah. Lee told me one time that his uh, teacher, Manny Erez, during the war, was in, lived in London uh, and Wait, got, the contract it, yes. from, got the contract from the Air Force to turn shaving brush handles, and he turned 250,000 shaving yeah, brush handles. time. That... Wow. By hand. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm, well, hey, well, I've read John a little later. later. I'm so used to having it. Those would have been wood. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Ivory's another matter altogether. If you've got 50 letters from Bill Jones, you you might consider publishing those. You could talk to uh, the GMC people, you know, the Wood Turning Magazine people, their parent company. They published the original books from Bill Jones in the first place. Uh, I have a, I've got them around here somewhere. I've got one of them anyway. Very entertaining oh, stuff. Amazing guy. You're sure right about that. Yeah, yeah. I've got them here. I will have to. Hunt them out and see. They got the letters. Never look. You might have a little booklet there or something or something or an online thing. You know, get your best deep reading voice on and read them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the the on Tuesday night somebody mentioned a, a Turner, which I Rudy Oslonik. Osolnik. Rudy Osolnik. Osolnik. I went digging up and there was I found I found a great early video. Of his life history, fascinating guy. I actually went to him particularly because he taught at Berea College, and I had friends who graduated there, and I kind of respect that institution for what it does in Appalachia. But man, what a guy! And he he developed about three or four of the things that we consider common. Yeah, style. He also, uh, he was also one of the key people in founding the AAW. He was one of Albert's mentors. And uh, he, he was all over everything in the in the set in the eighties. So, it would be interesting to have a a presentation of his work here sometime. You know, like we used to with some different guys. I know he's not living anymore. Albert, but, 
Albert has the slideshow to do that. Does he? Okay. Yeah. That would be great to do sometime. Yeah. So. I haven't been doing those interviews mostly through inertia, um, right. you know, but, and also I put out a call, you know, well, who would you like to talk to? And nobody, and the only guy who ever came back on that was Nick Cook and we had Nick Cook on. And so if you got people you want to talk to who are still alive, you know, uh, let me know and we'll see if we can get them on. It's not hard. I mean, uh, the most, most everyone I've ever asked to come and do a slideshow for the Wood Turner's Coffee Hour has always said, yeah, sure. So, John, yeah, I'd like you to arrange somebody who's dead now. Just, yeah, well, that's the trouble. Maybe you can channel Rudy O'Solnik. Uh, you know, you're not from the right part of the country. You must have somebody on here from Kentucky. <laughs> Doug, it sounds like you're here today. That's good. Uh, I've got a candidate for you, John. Uh, Chris Ramsey. I've never, first time I heard the name. Oh, no, no. You know Chris Ramsey. He's the head guy. Head what do you guy? Head guy. Head guy. He lives up in Kentucky. Oh, he, uh, he, he does some fabulous, fabulous work. He, he used to, uh, he, he's had some shoulder injuries, so I think he's sidelined from turning for a while. But uh, he bought some property up there in Kentucky, and he's, he was developing a school, uh, a, a turning school, and then he got got sidelined with with the injuries. But I, I visited his place with Emiliano. Achaval on the way back from St. Louis, and and uh, some of his turnings will absolutely blow you away. I mean, the size of them, and I mean, burls, burls, that that this this big, literally with a uh, pot with legs on it. Huh. I mean, wow. amazing stuff. Really. But he would he would be very good. He'd have some excellent. Uh, I'll do a little. I, I think he'd be happy to do that. I'll do a little looking around and see what I can learn a little bit about it because it's new to me and I'll get in touch with you, Mike, about how yeah. to set it up. Sure. Uh, those are fun, the interviews. You know, I, I, I think they are. I don't know. I, you guys enjoy them? Let me know. Yeah. Wait, yeah? Can we do an yes. interview slideshow? I mean, we don't want it every week, but, you know, I used to try and do it every month. Yes. I was thinking the other day we're missing that part. I didn't know if you ran out of contacts or what, so... Just took a look at uh, Amazon and that uh, Bill Jones book is $126 Canadian. Yeah. But that's all price that price. is is a clue that somebody ought to reprint that, you know. That's exactly uh, right, yeah. And GMC has the rights, you know, they don't usually miss a bet on that. So that, you know, that's one of the things small publishers will do is watch those kind of prices and say, uh, uh, something going on here. Uh, Windsor Chairmaking, there's some books like that. Uh, Stephen Hogman's book went up through the roof for a few years until we did the, the uh, Fox Chapel version of the how-to version of it. You know, so, you know, it's like that. It goes up and down. And it is 10 o'clock. Lancaster Wood Turner's Weekly Coffee Hour uh, for uh, Thursday, April the 4th, 10 a.m. Uh, April 4th, 2024. My name's John Kelsey. I'll be your moderator. Uh, on a personal note, I want to say that it is my daughter-in-law's birthday and my granddaughter my daughter's birthday tomorrow and they're all in their mid-50s what does that tell you <laughs> uh <clears throat> let me see in terms of announcements uh lancaster club's open shop is not this coming saturday but the following saturday i guess that's the 13th uh, this saturday the amtrak group is meeting at the studio uh, around 11 o'clock we'll have the boxes there all painted we'll have all the work there by then we'll have drafts of all the labels there we're going to set it up and see what we got that'll tell us what we're missing and what doesn't work and what we need to move around and we'll uh, then also be equipped to get labels back out to people to proof before we print the real mccoy on the expensive clear stock and we can just stick down a little gently we're squeezing all the label info onto the uh, small size one inch by two and five eighths labels uh, type's going to be big enough to see it's, it'll it'll work out all right but it, it it's a, it's a bit of a typographic squeeze, but it's okay. Um, anybody got any questions or comments or curious about the Amtrak thing? Yeah, John, are you going to make up the labels or do I make it up? I'm making them up. We want them all to be the same. Okay. I just want your information. I'm going to come over and get your stuff this afternoon, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Ron's the last pulled out of 33. <laughs> so, no, Ben Kaufman has to deliver a piece yet, too. <clears throat> it's been a hell of a good showing. I mean, we've got more than 30 people participating out of a club with about 100 members. 
Uh, it, and we've we've invested heavily in display stuff. Barry made a set of 22 carefully calibrated size boxes that are 12 by 16 on the top surface and vary in height and increments. So we can arrange those in dozens of different ways and then they'll fit inside the Amtrak cases, but they'll also be of use to us in every other situation we come across. He, Barry found some 3 16 flat plywood and being the guy he is, he, he, he got it all to glue together. He got little, you know, glue blocks in there. They're, they're light, uh, they're flat, uh, the, the hickeys are all filled and Rick Atkins sprayed them with paint. So it all worked out, uh, amazing effort. I mean, those two guys pumped out this, this $500 worth of plywood in there. And, he, and when he was done, there was like a little pile of scrap about, you know, like this. So very successful little operation. <coughs> Uh, and you guys are going to be really delighted to see it in the Amtrak station. As it happens, the track from Lancaster to Harrisburg is being replaced this summer, and that means all the trains are going to stop in Lancaster, and everybody's going to get on a bus. So we're going to get more traffic than ever past uh, past our cases. So all of that's worked out. It's going to work out pretty nice. And we're looking now for a venue to continue at least part of the show right up to the. Uh, to the uh, mid Atlantic in late September. I just, we haven't done anything or made any inquiries. We've been talking about it. There's some momentum behind the idea. So if we can get a showcase in the hotel or something or a table at the uh, instant gallery or some other thing, we might ask some of the people to leave the work, some of the work behind for a while. I know some of the work has been sold already and has to go back out to who owns it. So that's how it goes. Uh, I got some stuff I want to show you, but I'm going to go to the floor because there's a bunch of people with hands up. I can come back later on. Um, and I see a bunch of hands, but Ron, what do you, what, what do you got your hand up? What do you want to show us? Call me, John? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I wanted to bring up the, the Mid-Atlantic Wood Turning Symposium. We have that coming up. I put the dates in the chat, but there were a couple ideas on, on uh, things that some of the clubs could do to support the uh, we had a raffle last year where people bought tickets and dropped them in, picked up a, a uh, pretty nice prize. And uh, the thought was that the, when we talked about this years ago too, the, the club buys a ticket to the uh, symposium and then raffles it off in their, in their meeting. So that to give one of their members gets a free ride to the symposium for buying a raffle ticket. And, if you make enough money to cover the ticket, maybe you can make a few bucks for the club. So I just wanted to bring that up and remind people that. And I'm responsible for bringing in the equipment, setting it up, taking it back out again. And so I need volunteers, anybody that's going to be in the area or be at the symposium, uh, get in touch with me. My email is in the chat. Okay, any questions for Ron about the Mid-Atlantic? The roster of teachers this year is fantastic. They've got Alan Lacer, they've got uh, Stuart Batty. I forget some of the others, but those two guys are like stellar world class. You, you don't hardly ever get to see them teach and they're both in the same place at the same time. We'll be trying to get some of that action onto the coffee hour, but I don't know what we'll be able to do because they get pretty busy. But anyway, uh, it's gonna be a terrific event this year as it always is. Yeah, I don't have the full list of uh, demonstrators. There's six, gonna be six demonstrators. That's on the, uh, the Mid Atlantic website. Yeah. That's been set up. The actual rotations are not set yet, but they'll be set in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. And the uh, it's just a it's just a lovely event for anybody in reach of Lancaster. You know, and if you're a few hours away and you want to come to the Mid Atlantic, you know, this forum is a way of meeting people in different places. You just might find somebody with a guest room where you don't have to have a hotel. You know, it's always possible. Um, so let's see, I got my screen scrambled here for a minute. Let me try and get it right. Hang on a sec. And this one has to get smaller. Just kidding. Remove, uh, I don't know. I'm all, all scrambled up with the screens this morning. The recording is going to be weird this week. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ron. Anything, any other questions or comments for Ron? He does need people for the move-in team. That always takes a hard-working bunch of strong guys. Yeah. Uh, Ted, are you there? Ted Luttrell? Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm here. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 
Okay, let me uh, bring the screen up. Okay, can you see it now? Um, it's starting. We haven't quite there. We got it. Okay. Yep. Well, last I think the last week I showed you I had made a uh, little shop improvement plan and I uh, showed you the bench I made. Well, this week I finished the uh, set of eight drawers for it, which came out pretty nice, and I'm looking forward to uh, filling them up at this point. Um, nice job. Thank you. It came out good. I I enjoyed it. And I, uh, I'm looking forward to all the extra space because my shop is kind of full up at this point. So I added all these drawers. They're all um, dovetail drawers uh, made out of um, made out of ash. So they're heavy and, and uh, very strong. Um, I, I, I can put heavy stuff in them that I had some heavy stuff in another drawer I had, you know, that's the, the bottoms kind of fade. These 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 won't falter at all. Those look and, like uh, uh, rudder dovetails. Am I right about that? You didn't saw those by hand. I did not saw those by hand. I use a dovetail jig. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, so, uh, anyhow, go ahead. That was anyhow, the, this is a uh, just a little um, a little thing I turned out. I had a piece of wood I was going to throw away. Pith was in the wrong spot and. My son was looking for a pencil holder on the uh, in his shop, so I put that together. It came out kind of fun. Nice piece. Um, I don't know if I showed this piece the last time. I uh, just a little. Uh, this was interesting because it was a piece of uh, maple that was uh, kind of, you know, had blackish gray spots in it from uh, you know the wood sitting around too long. I put a little bit of light dye on it. And it came out like that. I was, I was, uh, you know, watching Toby and all his dyes. I said, well, I have to try this. This isn't very colorful, but it, it covered up all the black and gray, which is what I was after. So what uh, dye did you use? I mean, what color and how thin? Um, I used a, it was a, it was a kind of a, kind of a brownish color because uh, I was just trying to see if it would absorb the gray. I did it very thin. Uh, I tried it on another piece of wood. I had it too, I had it the, the dye too thick as I did the first time I tried dye. And uh, listening to all you guys, I, I, I thinned it out. So it's kind of a little skim coat and it just, just worked great. It was, it was a water-based dye. <clears throat> very pretty. Oh, uh, there's that. that picture was out of order. So my uh, my shelves on my workbench were all full extension. Um, and they can handle, uh, the ones on the bottom can handle 200 pounds. The other six on the top can handle 100 pounds. So anyways, that's all I had. Just thought I'd show that. Good job on that bench. Thank you. Good job on sweeping the floor too, or whatever it is you do. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's messier than it looks in the picture, trust me. <laughs> Any questions okay. for that? Okay. Uh, before I go around to the other guys, Don and uh, Bowman, because I know you guys both have juicy stuff, I wanted to talk to Mike Peace a little bit about your demo the other night. You there, Mike? I am. Yeah. That was fun. I thought that was a really good demo. Thank you. Uh, you got anything you want to add about it or that you wanted an afterthought? No, not really. Other than encourage people to, whether they play chess or not, it's a great it's a great exercise. We talked about it before the meeting started about uh, repetition, turning lots of small items, and by the time you turn sixteen pawns, you'll develop some basic uh, tool control. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, I also I mean, I've been doing a lot of work on my library, and I've been finding books. Uh, I found three so far of pictures of chess sets from different historical eras or different points of view, stuff I've just collected over the years and stuffed someplace. So that's around too. You can uh, talk about old books. Mike, I'm going to I just want uh, to mention the stuff that I'm losing. With too okay. many ones. Okay, Doug first. I, I just want to say I really appreciate it because I've been planning on making a chess set and your, your uh, screw chunks 
for holding the pieces is one of the vital pieces as far as I'm concerned of your whole thing is making sure you have those blank screw trucks. It was just an outstanding idea on how to get that started. That was my biggest stumbling block to getting started in the first place. So thank you very much. Uh, we, we all stand on the shoulders of giants and that was not an original idea. I picked it up somewhere probably from somebody's YouTube video, uh, but you don't see many people using it. I'm going to adopt that. I thought that was a really good technique. I Mike, just, uh, I just something wanted you said to add... there about making yeah. repetition, getting muscle memory and so forth, reminds me of, of a demonstrator I heard one time. First thing he said when he got up there, he said, don't believe anything I tell you. And, and the point is, I'm going to tell you a whole lot of things about how to do this and that, but you're not going to learn it until you do it. So go home and do it. That's, and exactly. that's a good point, I think. That's exactly right. I just I just wanted to reiter, reiterate uh, thanks to Mike uh, for an excellent demo um, that wasn't just about turning chess sets, but it was about finding inspiration for different kinds of shapes and chess sets. And it obviously doesn't only apply to chess. So I think that has a lot of relevance across the whole the whole span of of anything really, wood turning and what have you. Um, and and the challenges and the way you presented it, you made it accessible to not only advanced turners, but new turners, uh, the shapes and still, you know, and graduating from something simple to something complex. So I think you covered a really nice range of, of aspects of turning and and specifically turning chess sets. So thanks again. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Yeah. Anybody else? I intend it to just as the new wood turner. turner. There's a new wood turner. Who is the new wood turner? This is Bill Heaps. Uh, as a new wood turner, I really appreciate taking the time and showing the, the chuck as well with some of the technique. I mean, I pick up little things that you say and do to help me in what I do. So I, I do appreciate those little details, even though the big picture of the chess set was, was very fascinating. It's uh, the technique and how to do some of these things is what I'm learning. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Somebody else got cut off there. Who else was trying to talk? Okay, we got them all in. <laughs> Last chance, anybody else on this? Thanks again, Mike. I, I'm going to make a set myself. I've been putting it off for years. You, you inspired me to go go for it. And I, I found myself taking pictures of some of those Russian sets that you showed. Those are really interesting. Yeah. Okay, Don Smith, what would you like to talk to us about today? Right, I've got a bowl that I've made. So I'll just show you. That's the front of it. Not a lot of wormholes there. <laughs> I quite agree with you. Yes. It's uh, a bit of coloring on a piece of uh, maple. And that's the back of it. I've still got to take the foot off. What are you going to do on the back? What, what's your objection to that foot? Aside from I'm the just going part. to take the foot off flats because at the moment it tends to rock a bit. I may leave it, but we'll see as time goes on. But the, the, the point I was trying to show is the uh, colouring of this black and dark green that's on the back and i've tried to copy it to the front and that's pyrography is it and die no 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 it's um it's the, the bowl was turned and before the final cut was done i sprayed i sprayed the base the rim black and then with a uh, proton, prosop, proxon um, angle type grinder, I decorated the black to make it white. And then I sprayed it green over the top of the whole piece. And then. So the, so the black is the, carved into the wood or not? No, the black. Yes, the black is cut. Sorry, I've done that wrong. The black 
I, I textured it, sprayed it black, and then with a sanding pad, not my fingers, I just very lightly took off the top of the texturing so that it became white wood and then sprayed that green. So you had the green, the blacks inside the texturing right. and the green sits on top. And so and then, the green didn't affect the black, it only affected the white wood that you'd sanded. That's to. correct, yes. Okay, now I got it. Thank you, Dylan. Yeah. And then, of course, I, when I'd done the back, I then turned the base off and made a small ridge here where my fingers are, a small ridge there, and then turned it over. And before I turned the whole of the center out, I did the same thing with the front and did the same spraying operation. And then I took out the center of the bowl. So you did the center of the bowl after you finished the rib? Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. Now there's a tip for everybody. <laughs> because doing it that way, if you spray it, doesn't matter what goes on in the inside if you take it out afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you don't get the bleed of uh, any of, if you've got a wood that would take the dye and would make it bleed slightly. By doing it this way, you've taken that bleed out. So you end up with a bowl which looks like that. Hey, Don. Uh... Not only do I like the embellishment, but I really like the design of the bowl too. Could you hold it up so I can see the entire bowl? Yeah, I really like the shape of that thing. It came out really nice. OG. Lovely, yeah. thank you. Yeah, well done. That's like OG. Well, that's it all I've got to go out. It makes me want to go out and buy a Proxon tool, uh, Don. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, since I have you here, and since before we started, we were talking about Bill Jones, the ivory, uh, the old time ornamental and ivory turner, who was so amazing. Do you live? Did you live near him, or where did he live in relation to you? He lived uh, three and a half hours away. Okay, so you wasn't, you couldn't just drop over and visit. No, no, we had him for the. Um, we picked him up on Friday. Stayed with us. He did the demo on Saturday, stayed with us Saturday night, and went home on Sunday. Did he still turn billiard balls as well, or snooker balls? Uh, not that I know of. Okay. I think he gave out quite a long time ago. There but, wasn't that much ivory left. He didn't have that much large ivory left at that point, probably. Yeah. Um, well, if you... On the front of uh, Bill Jones's book, he, you'll see him in his workshop, and you uh, wonder how he did any work at all, actually. Uh, when yeah, that's that for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a little wee man there surrounded by stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I've got two of his books here. Um, but the thing with Bill Jones was that whenever he did thread tation, he always used an armrest. He never used the rest as a rest. It was always an, an arm rest. What do you mean? What do you mean? Well, it's a, I've got one. Um, I'll tell you what, if we, I'll go and get it. And if we've got time, I'll show it to you right at the end. All right. That'll be good. What I, it I, is. I know a little bit about what you're talking about. And I'd like to have the group see it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So here's, 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 a, here's a picture of his shop. Well, who's, who's holding that up? Mike. Mike. Okay, Mike got a photograph. Spotlight. Hang on a second. I got to remove the spotlight. I got to. Uh, we got some crazy stuff going on here in the screens today. They're not behaving the way they're supposed to. Just have Mike talk now, and he'll pop up. Yeah, it's it, it's a fat. These are fascinating. There it is. Books, there it is. Fascinating <laughs> books to read, and he was a. Uh, he wrote an article for the British Wood Turning Magazine once a month for twenty four months, and then they basically compiled his his articles. Uh, as chapters of these two books, and they're just fascinating. Yeah. I got both of those, Mike. Yeah. Fascinating. Both signed. Oh, that, that'd be a treasure. The treasure. <laughs> I've got at least one of them here, and I might have the other. I'm going to try and run them down later today. Thanks very much, Don. Good to hear from you. Okay. I'll, I'll come back. I'll get it, and I'll talk to you five minutes right. before the end. <laughs> Well, I'm going to hold on to your video till later, if that's okay with you. Whatever works for you. Okay. Mike Brazo. 
And then Malcolm. Yeah, I just, I, I'd like to add my accolades to Mike's demo on Tuesday night. And it, it brought back memories for me. If I can do a share screen here. Yeah, go for it. Um, I got my screens back in order now. I bought Mike Darlow's book on chess sets about 20 years ago and never ever got around to doing it. And this was about a dozen years ago. A fellow had bought this, this the one on the right and the queen in the center, had bought this chess set at a sidewalk sale, but he was missing the boxwood king. So he wanted a king turned. And uh, the one on the left here is the king I turned out of maple and tried to die. I had a perfect color match for the boxwood on a piece of paper. But when I put it on the maple, it came out quite darker. But he was pretty happy with the outcome. That took me four hours because you're really not into a rhythm. This is hard duplicating. And uh, I think I came fairly close to it. I think the camera doesn't give a true image. It was um, it was pretty much identical in size. I think it was a 64th fat here. <laughs> anyway, it was quite a project. It was, I, I've always uh, remembered that. Someday, I don't know. I don't think I'll ever get to a full set. That's the standard stunting pattern. Or a yeah, it was, it was a nice set. Um, yeah. This yeah. looks like a rosewood. I'm not sure exactly what it was. This is boxwood, the queen. He gave me the queen for the color. And uh, that was a challenge, but it was fun. I, yeah. I still have some boxwood. I'm going to see what I can get together. I've got some Pocobolo too. So uh, this gets started. Uh, I, I, I sniff a good new project coming along. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Malcolm. I think you you got your hand up. What do you want to talk about? You're muted. He's 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 not muted. He doesn't have his mic on. Yeah, your mic's not on. How about that? Now we got you. All right, there you go. All right, I'm changing the subject a little bit from chess pieces to Themispheres, which uh, I've gone on a Themisphere kick for the last couple of weeks. And uh, it's one of the yeah, They're attenuated spherecons. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. What, well, what we call a Themisphere. Uh, um, it starts but, out yeah. as a spherecon. I mean, it's the same thing, the same thing but you, you, you attenuate it by turning those curves in it, where a spherecon would have straight sides. Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole pile of names, a streptohedron and um, all, all sorts of things. But uh, yeah, there, that, that one, of course, is, is a black walnut with uh, texturing and, and uh, a black ink dye. It's very nicely um, And this one is uh, a black cherry. Again, texture and a black ink dye. That one's got a dent in it now, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. So I, I just I've gone stupid here. It's one of those things. Once you start doing these things, you you get carried away. And the first couple were plain, and then and then I got into a lot. I've been doing a lot of texturing on a lot of ink dyeing on a lot of things lately. So I had to have a go with this. Now you don't those don't open up and become a box, now, do they? No. Um, There's another challenge for you. No, I, I'm, I'm not a box person. Um, like I've done boxes, but um, I, this is not something that I'm going to box. Uh, this is just something that I produce for fun. It gives me something to do in my retirement. Really nice. Thank you. Questions and comments for Malcolm? Anybody? I know that Skinner's been making Spiricons. I've made them for years. Okay, well, thank you very much. So what, what, what did you use to put the uh, uh, the radius on, like the marking? You got the uh, embellishment in such a perfect circle. Did you put that circle on before you spun them halfway around? Um, yeah, they're well without the uh, the darkness on there. They are a grain match, so it starts off as a five by five inch cube five by five by five inch cube which is 
marked marked for centers, cut, rotated 90 degrees, put back together, turned, put back together with a piece of paper in there so you can get it apart again, and then split and rotate it again. Um, yeah, the uh, the line around there to separate, you put that in while it's being turned in in this orientation yeah. before you split it. And that was my to... question. Yeah, thanks. That was yeah. great. Yeah, thank you. I like your tip there because you said a grain match. I hadn't thought about doing like that, but that's perfect. Is that you actually have uh, one more step because you you cut it in half, and then to get the grain match, you when you turn it, you have the grain match. I didn't think about that. Usually mine are all half uh, 90 degrees out because I just turn them out of a block and only have one split. But splitting it first and uh, and then uh, gluing it together and then splitting it with a paper joint later, <clears throat> I'm going to have to try that. Did you make a video of that? No, I, I'm not that technically savvy. Uh, uh, I've been asked to do a couple of demonstrations on these things, but I... It's, it's a lot of work to get yep. all that stuff together and travel and no. So this is as, probably as far as I'm going. Well, I appreciate that. that. That's the tip I picked up, though. I'm going to have to think about that, and i got to try and make one. I like the grain match idea. That that just, just intrigues the hell out of me. Now I've got another challenge. David Springett well, writes about that in his books. It's a, it's yeah, and when you make it with as a box, it really makes a, with a, a showy grain wood. People have no idea how the hell you did it. I've got a, a Weiss vlog. Uh, um, they call it a drunken box, and the uh, same thing. He made. I've uh, seen that in Utah, and he 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 made one there, and I ended up buying it off him. Yeah. And uh, I, I just love that thing. Very nice. Those you things. can't you can't match the green, a hundred percent. Um, because you lose some material when you cut it and you lose some material when you, when you, after you glue it, you have to re -true those faces. Those faces have to be dead flat when you split them. Um, and then you rotate it. And probably the most difficult thing of the whole thing is gluing it back together in its final orientation, because there's nothing there to to clamp on, um, to squeeze those, the little ends have to be squeezed. And I've made up some jigs and stuff to it to try and accomplish that. And then they're getting better. But I do, uh, it. I do it between cup centers on the lathe, to use the tailstock for pressure. I use rubber bands. I just got a whole bunch of rubber bands and just keep grabbing, you know, more and more and more and more rubber bands. It looks like a golf ball before I let the glue dry. In other words, both of those will work. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would love to see a demonstration of how these things are made. It just kind of boggles my mind. Uh, we could probably organize one uh, for the club. Um, you could certainly go to YouTube, and uh, YouTube, there's, there's yeah. people on YouTube that do it. Yeah. It'd make a fun club, although it's a longer process. It'd be quite tough to get the whole process into an hour. You'd have to have props prepared. Anybody else on this? Okay, Bowman. Bowman's got a video he wants to show, I think. Yeah. I tell you, it makes me nervous. Because <laughs> I'm this I have the same problem you guys do, uh getting online. Uh I'm gonna share this. And I assume you're seeing that. You're seeing your directory. Yes. Oh. And and I'll select from it then. Let me get it larger right now. Uh, just quick comment. Uh, those of you who weren't at the LAW meeting on Tuesday night, this was my April Fool's turning. This was a burl with a, a burl with a big crack on the tree side, and I turned a bowl for the burl and then took the two inch slab and. Clue, I had to epoxy it back together because I had a bark intrusion that kept it apart. Anyways, uh, that was my fun. Uh, I hadn't done burls for a while. And while my granddaughter was here, I started sorting through and I found this one. Okay, video. 
John, I guess, how do I turn the, the audio on for this? Let me it's get part it of the share. You, you, it's part of the part of when you go into the share, there's a button on the bottom of the screen that gives you uh, optimized video and audio. So yeah, well, let me stop again and go back because yeah, yeah, the last back. time I showed one. So you restart your share, look at the bottom of the screen, you know where the big blue box is where you get to choose what to share? Yeah. At the bottom there, there's a button. Or a book no, not on mine. Uh, it has options and layouts, but that's all. Oh, share sound. Okay, they moved it. They moved it. Yeah, it's over the right hand it. side now. Yeah, Bottom but it's on the right hand side. I just found it. Okay, okay, let's get back to the project at hand. All right, now this, um, I'm sharing this not as a how to video. Sorry about the black, it'll come on as soon as I press play. Um, but it's my personal experience of making one of these emergent bowls. But the, the thing was I had gotten some ironwood from out in the Sonoran Desert in Phoenix area, in Mexico actually came out of, uh, to make one of these. And I didn't know how it was gonna turn. You'll see, uh, and I'm open to hearing what your comments are. Are you hearing it? All good. Yeah.
that's a fabulous video. It's a really good video. Thank you, fun, Jim. I've been, what what I happened use, whenever the piece came out? It was was it the fixture broke? Uh, no, it did not. Apparently, it's some kind of catch. But the challenge when you turn the flat surface after the bowl to make the bowl emerge is getting that nice edge around. And I switched to my squarest cutting uh, chisel, and it must have caught something. Uh, it, yeah. You were putting it, a square end into a, a, a less than square angle is what you were doing. Right. Yeah, it was a little bit. I wanted a sharp edge where the bowl ended on the flat spot. But what you ended up with was catching the rotation on two different parts of the tool, two different speeds. That's always going to catch yeah, and uh, it left a nice gouge in it. This is uh, this uh, I I left out about an hour or two of screw ups because this one really knocked me around. But in the end, I was very happy with what I got, and I guess as long as you enjoyed doing it, um, yeah. That I well, I'll I think try to be right process, but yeah, it it shows me something. I mean. That maybe not what you maybe is what you intended. I don't know. Um, I can usually follow these things, and I have not been able to understand how people make those things. And I now do from watching your videos. So you very well conveyed the information. But I also I just love the pace of the video and the editing, and that shows you the difference between us amateur video dudes and somebody who's done it for a living and knows actually knows what they're doing. Well, and, uh, yeah, that's that's motivation for me. But John, I made this for you, actually. I remember you tell me a couple times, you know, what I'm saying I say, go look at Mike pieces. And then I thought, well, Mike does such a nice job of teaching. This was not a teaching, but I want you to get an impression of how it's done, at least how I do it. I I enjoy these and I'm going to make some more, I think. I. Uh, <laughs> The you iron you've inspired me, Jim, because uh, after I did that one in the video, uh, it's like, man, this is this is hard and jigging it up is difficult. And and I had the idea to do uh, an emerging box and I need to do at least one more to justify the cost of that uh, core box bit. <laughs> well, well, I, why are you why are you using that? What, what's special about that? I mean, why can't you just turn that with, with a gouge? Well, you can, but that that makes it into a perfect hemisphere. Yeah, that's uh, so it makes it real easy for that particular size. But it is a very scary uh, uh, bit router bit to use. Yeah, and and the other ones I use. Well, I bought I had that bit in my in my bit rack be, from before when I made uh, iPhone amplifiers, basically what you call little wooden things with domes on the side that amplify. Anyways, uh, this time, before when I used it, the first time I made a couple of these after I saw your video, Mike, uh, I was using softer wood and it, I turned right in and just, I didn't have to stop and dig it out. But this ironwood, it, it formed almost like chunks inside. And also, I think all along, and you saw my chisel ch chattering, I think it still wasn't firmly seated in the in the jig. The jig drives me crazy how to do it. I've done a couple different ones because you have to, if you make the jig for say three inches then every blank that you use has to be exactly that three inches. Uh, so I don't know, I use carpet tape to hold it in and then I used a hot melt glue along the edge and that didn't even hold so I think you should try the wood turning tape it's a different uh, it's better than the carpet tape you think so you think that's so. like yes spectra yes. spectra tape or something like that yeah. is that what yes it's extremely extremely strong but as you, as you if you demonstrate it there's a lot of forces on that kind well, of work and you you've got to have the wood reinforcing the blank for sure. Yeah. 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 And, and I, Jim, yeah. Sorry, you guys talked about several things. I noticed you use the hot melt glue on the outside diameter, but you didn't seem to use anything on the inside at the bottom. So you're only supported at one side. So when it broke out, it flipped out from the inside out. If you'd put a small piece of wood or some hot melt glue underneath the 
to the center line. I, did, I didn't I'm show saying? that. I didn't show that. I had a quarter inch piece of plywood supporting the bowl yeah. Yeah. and hot melt on the bottom too. I, 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 I just didn't so, show it. No, I, I saw that it was visible on the video. Um, yeah. And that with the tape, with the proper wood turning tape, it's pressure sensitive adhesive. And you don't just stick it down. You stick it down and then use the tailstock as a ram and go have a cup of coffee for 20 minutes. It sets up, the grip increases hugely in that 20 minutes of pressure time. Well, then that explains when I watched Mike, he commented about that. And I thought, okay, so I left mine sit in. Again, I didn't show it. I, I said, well, if Mike said it, it helps it set up, I would. I will try a different thing. Now, I think the thing I'm going to do right from the start is bring up my ch uh, rubber chucky uh, and hold the after after I get the bowl ground out and hold it because it can press against the wedge underneath sure. it. That and, will help you with that. That will help avoid a catch like that. That will mitigate, right. that will resist a small catch. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay. and that would, once I did that, but yeah. It it needs to be refined a little. I changed the jig platform. I went to a one inch MDF. I used to have a three quarter inch piece of plywood, which I didn't trust very well. So I went to a one inch MDF, which is it's really flat. I checked it against the, my tool rest, and it's flat. But holding it in is the biggest challenge. Yeah. So, John, uh, Jim, I got a uh, comment, or I guess a question. I've been thinking about making those and I've watched people making their jigs <clears throat> and your comment about having to make the jig exactly the size of the wood you're starting with and um, and you got a counterweight on it. And uh, so I built a jig with a counterweight, but I'm always nervous about the counterweight maybe not being just right. And then when you change the wood, the weights change and it is vibration. I just get nervous. So I, I, when I do one, I'm going to do what you did turn the globe on the end of the stick, and then I'm gonna glue two pieces of scrap wood on either side, and then mount that on, and I can screw into the waste wood. And then when I'm turning, I don't have to worry about the pressure or anything, because there'll be a paper joint on either side of my finished product with waste wood glued to it. And that way the counterbalance issue goes away because you can put wood all the way around, and it's basically like turning a platter. You don't have any uh, jerky stuff. I'm not understanding because you have to cut it in half to get to the bowl to clue yep. it out. What, yep. But once once the bowl's cut in half, on either side. Uh, we'll, uh, yep. no, we'll see the pictures, Bert, when you do it. Yep. Yep. That's exactly what I'm thinking of. Because yeah. uh, thanks for the inspiration, Jim. Because I'm I'm now going to make one because you you've inspired <laughs> me to to do that, and then I'll take pictures of how I put it together because it's another step. But I'm nervous and, about having counterweights and well, trying to fit look, things. If you look at Stephen Hogman's book about how he makes some of the walking bowls and the things like that are basically airplane propellers, they are yeah. always mounted in a disc with wood around them. So you're never putting your fingers into an airplane propeller. That, that's probably where I got the inspiration for that kind of thinking yeah. on it. because that, I, I, that is the way yeah. to do that stuff safely. Yeah. Jim? Jim? Yes? I noticed you, only, you had white knuckle. Syndrome. <laughs> yes. I I also feel that you the length of your tool didn't give you the control you should have had for turning. You I feel you might be better with a shorter handled tool on some of that work rather than that long one because I don't think you've got control over the tool complete. This is my opinion. Yeah. I, I would have said the same, but I wasn't going to. Yeah, you got it, Don. Yeah. I, I, I need to ask you guys why. I've heard that before from you, Don. Uh, the, the, long, the long chisel gives me better control of it. You get a catch, man, with a, you got a better angle on it. You can hang on to it. And but, my tool, the one that actually created the ch uh, catch was a shorter one. Uh, are you, I hope you're not talking only eight inch chisels, no. are you? No, I also felt that when you got that catch, you weren't, you didn't have it trailing. You had it more or less parallel. Instead of having you, you it. You think the the chisel I was think up, you were, up you went in like that instead of like that. 
Uh, with a, that was a carbide. I always go straight in with carbides. And it was a, I think that one, no, the one that caught wasn't. It wasn't a negative rake. I have mostly negative rate carbides and negative rate steel. But that one I used because it was squares and I didn't, yeah. No, I think I, I think you put a square, a square end into an acute angle and it caught over here and it caught over here at the same time. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think a diamond tool would work better there, Jim. Yeah. Uh, uh, I didn't show that. I tried it. I ended up getting a groove because it went in too fast and too far. <laughs> so I had to turn the surface down. This one, I was chasing my tail all day. So. A spear point, uh, a spear point uh, scraper, high speed steel like Richard Raffin uses to get into detail probably would have served yeah, you well. Would. Yeah. Okay. I agree with that too. Well, right. it, well, thank you, Bowman, for a delicious video. Very good. Thank you. Jim, one, one, one last comment. I I really liked you using that um, the bit that you used for doing at the center. But I, I find that doing something like doing a rough cut first, then using that bit just as the final cut makes it go a lot easier. Because yeah. you'll still get the sphere and you'll get because getting those bits to take out all that scrap wood to start with just is a real pain in the neck and, it's, yeah, and generates good. a lot of heat. Yeah. Well, Doug, I would not be doing these if, if I hadn't seen Mike use it on his demo that I saw, because I know that it's a potential for a major wreck up of that dome trying to chisel it out. And to me, the core bit was a safe, slow, easy way that the perimeters got right. I'm going to keep I, I, doing that. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I agree with what you're doing. The core bit is absolutely good there, but I'm just saying take maybe a quarter of an inch or a little bit out of the center of you with something else before you do that core bit and you'll find that the core bit just does that final thrust. So I still want you to keep using the core bit, just get rid of some of the waste wood first. In That's the okay. Of Doug, okay. I'll, I'll add that. I'll add that to my, uh, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay, yeah. uh, thanks again. I'm gonna move on though, because I got some stuff to say and there's a couple more guys with their hands up and uh, John is okay. gonna show us too. So, okay, there's, uh, let's look at Don's tool real quick. What do you got, Don? Well, this is, <clears throat> this is the armrest that Bill Jones uses. Okay, let's see the other part of it, the other end, right. the business part. Ah, that's what I thought it was. You call it an armrest, but yeah, it's actually a tool. It's a, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> it's. He uses that for threading and for other things, I bet, too. Yeah, for internal or external. But yeah. that's what he does. And he always, it, from the moment he went in his workshop, he put it over his shoulder. Yeah. And it was always there. And he just had it down by his side, picked it up. And do off you, he went. Do so you that, use one of those? That was his armrest. Do you use one of those? Yes. Yeah, I think I'm going to try one. I think that's a great idea. Ernie was talking about that not long ago as well. Yeah, but Don, I think D Way made one that you actually put on your arm, which I thought was a good way to bust your arm off when you caught yeah, it. Yeah, no, what Don has is the old way, old guy way. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to grab the spotlight just for a second here. Thanks, thanks for that, Don. Uh, I, I've got. I I was showing you my uh, contraption downstairs, my harmonograph, and I had made this. This is this is uh, one of the two pen arms, and this is the pen would be over here. Uh, in this piece, and then this is the shaft, the extension of the pendulum, and this has to rock and it has to pivot, and it has to not go up and down. So this is a stop collar here, and then it has a loose collar, and then it has this ring which is scooped inside, and two pins into holes so that it can have the motions it needs. And it weighs 80 grams, and weight is a real issue in these things. And at the end of the video, or the end of the time when I demoed or talked to you last week, I I realized that when Lawrence and I made this thing seven years ago, we used a little ball magnet instead for all that. And so here, this this does the very same thing. It's a three eighths inch ball magnet. There's a, a an upholstery tack in the end there with a little round head, a little decorative nail with a little perfectly domed head. And this is sitting on an eye screw. So I've got a couple of screw threads of an in and out adjustment. Plus it gets the ball in the right place. It has all the motions it needs. That weighs only 40 grams instead of 80 grams. So there you go. The, the, the power of magnetism. That left you silent. 
<laughs> yeah, you did a good job of explaining it, John. Okay. Uh, you just got the speechless, John. <laughs> oh. Bill Tapp. Yes. Um, I'm unmuted. Let's see. I'm... Yeah, you're good. You're good. Okay. We got you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jim, I just want to say nice work. Five years ago, I've done a, a series of these. And wow. uh, yeah, the, this is a little smaller one. Now, yours, this is a different version, but uh, some other time I'll, I'll go in detail how I made these. But yours has the raised rim. But I work essentially like with a cube or a, a solid square, cut it in half, and then, you know, I do the, the turning. But my bolt. Now, this is a bigger one. This is a, a challenge if you're afraid of centrifugal force and flying out. But uh, this is uh, almost six inches. And I use the, a bowl gouge. And uh, these have to be laid out accurately to get evenness, you know, in the thickness. And, you know, in other words, how it how it works out. But uh, these are real nice. But what I think Doug was talking about underneath here, when you're mounting this to uh, core out or however you do it, uh, put a wedge under there. And I use hot glue and a series of uh, clamps like you, you know, not the type of device you did, but it, you have to hold this back here and put a wedge here to keep the forces from, you know, tipping it. Cause this is half, half and half. This is on the center. So, and then this, I, I don't know, but you have a raised rim on yours. I like that too. But uh, yeah, this is what I did. Well, there you go. That's another variation on it. That's also very nice and very ingenious. And uh, it be, makes people go, huh. You go to a bigger, a bigger size and uh, it becomes a little more challenging as to spinning around and weight and that sort of thing. But it's fun cool. though. I, I really like it. So I'll try to get some, I have a whole bunch of things backlogged because I haven't been sharing and, but, but I have a lot of some cool stuff. So, but well, anyway, we'll, thanks we'll for doing it, Jim. We'll look, we'll look for you to bring a whole bunch of it on one day soon, you know, we're here. Yeah, every yes. Morning, that's what, <laughs> yep. I've been turning. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Randy Smith, last two minutes. What do you got? Uh, just a note. The Susquehanna wood turners uh, will be meeting on Tuesday night this coming and uh, starts at 630. We will be doing a sharpening hands on uh, demonstration. Uh, there will be no zoom component for this. We will have at least six grinders and sharpening stations set up. So if you're in the area, bring your tools and uh, uh, I'm going to send out an email later on today and just confirm who all is bringing tool, bringing solder uh, grinding stations. Uh, bring your jigs along and uh, we'll all have a good time learning to make our tools razor sharp. That's it. All right. Thank you, Randy. Uh, Vasco? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just wanted to say that uh, Nittany Valley Wood Turners had their meeting last night and we had a a uh, really good turnout of women because the demonstration and actually I did it we did rings pendants and uh, uh, bangles and that really brought a lot of interest in and we had a lot of women turners in so uh, just a heads up for some of the clubs that maybe you want to try something like that well you did that yeah, yeah I did that so would you like to come down to Lancaster and do that sometime uh, I can think about it Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> Ziegler's hey, actually Ken. our guy in charge of that, but uh, I'd like to see that demo. That'd be a good demo. Hey, okay. Ken, what, um, what's, what self-stick tape did you use to hold your appendants on? I bought it from Rockler as the wood turner's tape. Okay, what was, it, what was the brand, Spectra or something? Uh, I can't recall the, the name of it. It lasts okay. forever. Yeah, I, I I I can't know the name either because I I have a wide one and a narrow one and I probably bought it 20 years ago. So good. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you all. Lovely, uh, lovely winter's coffee hour as usual. See you all next week. Um, the weather's brightened up here. It's going to be sunny after days and days of rain. So good day. Go outside. See y'all. Thank, thank you, John. Thank you, John. Bye thank bye you, everybody. Guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jim. Bye. See y'all. Happy spring. Beautiful. Cheers, Mike. Bye. Yeah, take care, Don. Take care. What's everybody doing for the eclipse? Yeah. Taking a nap. <laughs> Don't go to Niagara Falls. They've already put out an emergency alert because they're happen. expecting a million people. I'm headed yeah. to Hamburg. Watch it on TV. It's going to be cloudy. There's don't one. don't burn your eyes. Don't burn your eyes. That's the motto. I'm gonna watch it on my big TV. Somebody will get a good view. <laughs> wood shop. Thank God for wood.